pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with my second go around with the tag I created quite recently called the BookTube Parasite Tag. I explained in way too much detail in my original video, see the show notes for the link, how this tag works or what it's all about. I'll put a briefer description in the show notes here and you can refer back to the original video. But basically, for the BookTube Parasite Tag, you find a video by some other BookTuber leech onto it and then comment on the books discussed in that video. Today I've dug one out of the archives from three years ago for one of my favorite booktubers, Ange of Beyond the Pages. And I have milked this video for all it's worth. I just think it's a wonderful way to dialogue with other booktubers and with the books they discussed. And we often watch videos, but how often do we take the time to really <laughs> sink into the books that they discuss and do some more research or really think hard about whether these would be books for me. So that's what I've done. There's more of a description in the show notes, like I said. Today I'm sponging off a two-parter series of videos that Ange did on J July 27th, 2015, so almost three years ago. And the first thing I have to say is, Ange, do you ever age? You look exactly the same now. She did a thrift store book haul and got most of these books for a, a dollar or two. So let me just get started. I'm going to comment on all of her books, but some of them will be very brief. And then I'll explain what I'm going to do with a few of them to do some more research. The first book she hauled was Catherine Mansfield's New Zealand Stories, so an anthology of her stories that were specifically set in New Zealand. I have never read Catherine Mansfield. I think I have a copy of The Garden Party, or maybe I just have it on Scribd. All of her stories are on Scribd. She's supposed to be a marvelous short story writer, so I'm going to take this opportunity to read one Catherine Mansfield story that's anthologized in this New Zealand Stories collection. I don't have the New Zealand Stories collection on Scribd, but I have basically all of her short stories available to me on Scribd, so I'm going to choose one that happens to be in this book, read it, and report back to you. The next book she talked about was a Isabel Allende book, Eva Luna, from 1987. I have heard very mixed reviews about Isabel Allende, but I've never read her. I'm not sure that she's going to be a writer for me, but there's only one way to find out, right? Scribd has the ebook of Eva Luna, so I'm going to read the first chapter or so and report back to you. The next one, The Accidental by Ali Smith. I've had mixed results with Ali Smith, but I think I really like her. I loved Autumn and didn't care for How to Be Both. The Renaissance artist half I didn't like. I loved the other half, so I loved half, hated half. Haven't got to winter yet. Expect I'm going to love it. Looking forward to trying more Ali Smith, but I'm a little bit hesitant just because I had that one fairly negative experience. And hauled several books from a book club. They were book club editions of some books from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I was particularly interested in those because I wasn't familiar with them. One was The Law by R Roger Véran, 1957 novel. He is a French novelist. I'd never heard, I've heard the name maybe, but don't know anything about him. This novel is set in a small Italian town and it's about all the social hierarchy, including the mafia and stuff. Didn't really grab me. The next one of these book, book club books was Amberwell by D. E. Stevenson, a female Scottish novelist. This novel is certainly set in Scotland from 1978, about a family, I think, between the two wars, I think, set on a Scottish estate, so they're kind of upper class. This is available to me on Kindle, so I'm going to do a free Kindle preview and give you my thoughts after having read a few pages. And two by Francis Parkinson Keys, which Wikipedia tells me, so you heard it here first, maybe, the correct pronunciation of her surname, which I didn't know, rhymes with skies, not keys. So it's Francis Parkinson Kies. Every used bookstore you go into has Francis Parkinson Keys at Kies books. I think my grandparents had her books. She was the wife of a U.S. senator, or Henry something something Kies and she 
died maybe at age 85 in 1970. And she converted to Catholicism. A lot of Catholic stuff going on in some of her later books, apparently. One was 1957, Blue Camellia, that Anne got. The other was its sequel, came out the following year, The Gold Slippers. Didn't sound particularly interesting to me. But I learned how to pronounce her name. And called The Hair with Amber Eyes by Edmund de Waal. I've talked about this book before on my channel. I'd like to read it. It's about a German-Jewish banking family and what happened to their extremely valuable collection of Netsuke art from Japan. I'm not sure if it would be for me, but I'm curious about it. Then she talked about the Yona Losi Riding Camp for Girls by Anton Di Sclafani. I've heard of this a little bit and I checked today and the reviews on Goodreads are atrocious, so I don't think I'm gonna bother with that one. Next, a novel that was made into a movie, One Day by David Nichols, about a couple they meet for the first time in their high school graduation and they meet annually, I guess at the high school reunion thereafter, but never see each other other than those annual visits, and it goes over 20 years or something. I think it's not going to be my cup of tea. I was going to make a joke, I'm going to read it one day, but no, probably not. And the last book on the first part of Angie's Thrift Store book haul from July 2015 was a Kate Morton novel, The Shifting Fog. I don't think Kate Morton's for me. It's basically a romance novel, right? A little historical romance novel. I tried one on audio and I didn't like it at all. It didn't get very far. So maybe someday I'll try her again, but not now. And on the second video, she talks about a Michael Cunningham novel, The Snow Queen. For many years, I considered Michael Cunningham my favorite author based on, it's not his debut, he has disowned his debut, but uh, what he considers his debut, uh, A Home at the End of the World, really spoke to me deeply as a young gay man. I haven't really enjoyed much of his later work that I've read, other than The, the Hours, I think is his masterpiece. The Hours is just fantastic. This is a 2014 novel, The Snow Queen. I think I bought this and gave it away because sometime after having bought it, I just realized how much I hate fairy tale retellings, but in the back of my mind, I have this idea of doing some kind of a vlog where I tackle this allergy that I have to fairy tale retellings by trying one and kind of doing a vlog of it, and maybe I can break through. I don't know, but I might. I can't remember if I don't think I still have it. I think I gave it away or, or, or traded it in at the used bookstore. Uh, next is a memoir by Jonathan Franz in The Discomfort Zone. I have read and loved his The Corrections and Freedom. I haven't read his most recent one, which is five years old now. This is a memoir about growing up, so I'm sure I would get a lot of stuff, the true story, quote unquote, that went into the corrections especially. But I don't really like memoirs, so I might try it someday, but not in any hurry to. Next was a book called Adventures on the High Tees. Kind of a memoir travel log in search of Middle England by Stuart Maconey, 2009 book. It's apparently the English Bill Bryson, and that doesn't sound like something I would be into. And then a few more of these book club editions in the middle of this second video. One is Doctor at Large by Richard Gordon, 1955. I've never heard of him. It's his pseudonym. His real name was Gordon Stanley Ostler. And he wrote a long series of comic novels about a doctor, and he himself was a doctor. In, in this book, one of his patients is inexplicably coughing up nuts and bolts. Not the snack, the, the real deal. So it's on Scribd. I'm going to try a chapter just for the fun of it. In fact, I think all of them are on Scribd in an ebook. So. so I will let you know. Next, a romance novel set in wartime Yorkshire. Wind on the Heath by Naomi Jacob from 1956. I'm not interested in that, so I will skip that. But the next one was really interesting for me, Onions in the Stew by Betty McDonald. My grandparents or my mom has that book. It's, I think we still have it at the farm. I've never read it. 1955, a humorous novel, an autobiographical novel about life in Washington State during the World War II years. It's on Scribd. I'm going to try a chapter.
And the last book club book was a Monica Dickens book. Now, you probably know, and I, I think I first learned of this from Thomas on the Reader's Podcast years ago. She is, as the name might suggest, Charles Dickens' great-granddaughter and apparently a really great novelist in her own right. This is The Room Upstairs, a 1966 novel. It's about an 80-year-old widow living alone in an old New England house. And she has some kind of an accident. It's on script. I'm going to try a chapter. I'll let you know. She talked about a historical novel from 2006, The Tea Rose by Jennifer Donnelly. I looked into it on Goodreads. Didn't really sound very interesting to me. But she talked about a Jeanette Winterson novel that, that I knew nothing about, Light Housekeeping, which is a great title. I, at first I was hoping, oh, maybe it's some kind of a takeoff on To the Lighthouse, which is my favorite Virginia Woolf novel until you mention another one, and then I'll say, no, that's my favorite, but I read To the Lighthouse last December. But no, this is about a, a young orphan that comes to live with a blind lighthouse keeper, and he tells her stories about somebody else from the 19th century, and she really connects with those stories that he's telling her. I haven't read a Jeanette Winterson since her debut, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, which I absolutely loved. And she's written about a thousand books since then. I've never tried another one. So I'm going to preview, uh, do a Kindle preview of the first uh, few pages or the first chapter of this and let you know. And she hauled Life After Life, the 2013 novel by Kate Atkinson. I love this novel so much. It's one of my favorite novels. If I had a top five list, this would be on it, I think. I read it two years ago, loved it. I still haven't got to the sequel. It's kind of a sequel, A God in Ruins. It's on my pile. I did it in my five-star prediction video months ago. Hope to get to it. I can't decide. I don't think I want to do two Kate Atkinsons in a year. So will I read her new novel, Transcription, which comes out, I believe, in the fall? Or will I read A God in Ruins this year? I guess I could do both, right? And the last one was White Oleander. I didn't write down the author's name, and I don't have it in my brain, but it was an Oprah book, I think, and I kind of poo-pooed it because so many Oprah books don't speak to me, although, good Lord, so many of them do, too. But I read the description of the story on Goodreads just now and saw, the, saw how many of my bookish friends gave it four and five stars. I should really give it a try but I'm not going to do anything with it for this the purpose of this video because that is the full list from Angie's thrift store book haul I'm going to preview seven of these books and get back to you with very quick reactions so let's get started with that hey here I am outside the Sakazen men's clothing shop at the Shinjuku Sanchome station Sakazen is a chain store, and it's the only uh, store in Japan, as far as I'm aware, that has plus-sized clothes. So, not even you don't have to even be as fat as I am, but just like chunky Western-sized man, and this is your only choice of shops. You can't get shirts or jeans or pants anywhere else in the country. And I'm gonna do some summer summer shirt shopping here. Anyway, I read part of a Catherine Mansfield story that's in that New Zealand book. It's called Prelude. It has eight sections. I only read the first section. Absolutely loved it. And all I'm going to do to make you fall in love with it is read you the opening. So here goes. There was not an inch of room for Lottie and Kezia in the buggy. When Pat swung them on top of the luggage, they wobbled. The grandmother's lap was full and Linda Burnell could not possibly have held a lump of a child on hers for any distance. Isabel, very superior, was perched beside the new handyman on the driver's seat. Holdalls, bags, and boxes were piled upon the floor. These are absolute necessities that I will not let out of my sight for one instant, said Linda Burnell, her voice trembling with fatigue and excitement. Lottie and Kezia stood on the patch of lawn just inside the gate, all ready for the fray in their coats with brass anchor buttons and little round caps with battleship ribbons. Hand in hand, they stared with round, solemn eyes, first at the absolute necessities, and then at their mother. We shall simply have to leave them, that is all. We shall simply have to cast them off, said Linda Burnell. 
A strange little laugh flew from her lips. She leaned back against the buttoned leather cushions and shut her eyes, her lips trembling with laughter. Happily, at that moment, Mrs. Samuel Josephs, who had been watching the scene from behind her drawing-room blind, waddled down the garden path. "'Why not leave the children with B for the afternoon, Mrs. Burnell? They could go on the dray with the store-ban when he comes in the evening. Those things on the path have to go, don't they?' "'Yes, everything outside the house is supposed to go,' said Linda Burnell and she waved a white hand at the tables and chairs standing on their heads on the front lawn. How absurd they looked! Either they ought to be the other way up, or Lottie and Kezia ought to stand on their heads, too. And she longed to say, Stand on your heads, children, and wait for the store man! It seemed to her that, that would be so exquisitely funny that she could not attend to Mrs. Samuel Joseph's. Well, I read a few pages of Eva Luna by Allende. Didn't like it, didn't hate it, but I don't really, her writing, this thought just came to me. Her prose is like words with mascara slathered on. Not for me. Hey there. So I'm taking you outside with my new selfie light walking around. <laughs> how how nerdy am I? Japanese people stare at me all the time anyway, so boy, they're sure going to... Oh, the lighting's pretty good with this. Except I have to walk where I'm, watch where I'm going. <laughs> this is with that light in my eyes. The road ahead is pitch black. I tried Amberwell by D.E. Stevenson, if I got the name right, the 1978 novel. Oh my god, it's terrible. <laughs> I read about three pages before I almost had to go throw up. The most insipid prose. Can you believe this? The opening line is, I can't remember the, the guy's name. William, maybe I do. William Ayrton was born in Edinburgh in 1745. Doesn't that just grab you and want to make you keep reading? Yeah, it was just, I couldn't believe how bad the writing was. So, no thank you to that one. Hey, so I also read four or five pages from the Richard Gordon Doctor at Large book, and I liked it a lot. Yeah, I want to read it. It's very light and breezy and funny. I was surprised by how good the writing was. So here's a, the opening paragraph or two. Qualifying as a doctor is an experience as exciting for a young man as first falling in love, and for a while produces much the same addling effects. Before my own new diploma had uncurled from its cardboard wrapper, I was prancing through the streets, hoping every pretty girl in sight would be seized with a fit of fainting, and longing at each crossroads for a serious accident. I scattered prescriptions like snowflakes, and squandered my now precious opinion on relatives, friends, and even people not looking very well, who happened to sit opposite me in railway trains. I frequently started conversations with, speaking as a medical man, and an appeal for a doctor in a theater would have brought me from my seat like a kangaroo. This is the coolest decorated exterior of an apartment building I have ever seen. Hey, so yeah, I walk by this apartment once a week on my way to my Monday morning teaching job and I just think it's so cool, hey? I'm not sure about the Christmas wreath all year long, but anyway, I previewed Betty McDonald's onions in the stew and needs more salt. <laughs> 
it needs more something. It's supposed to be funny. It's a memoir about living on an island in Puget Sound. And the humor just left me cold. The doctor novel made me smile. Maybe chuckle once or twice. This one just nothing. The writing's fine, just not funny. It doesn't strike my funny bone. And there's a lot of description of the physical scenic beauty and that doesn't work for me particularly. So that one's a miss for me. Needs more salt. Now that's quite a dentist drill, hey? Oh my. Okay, this is such an incredible backdrop that you're not going to listen to a thing I say, are you? <laughs> Guys, I just previewed the Monica Dickens novel, The Room Upstairs. Now this is some fine literary writing. Oh my god, it's the first thing I ever read by her, and I didn't want to put it down. The first chapter opens with a description of the commuters, or the people who typically drive on the highway between Boston and Cape Cod, and that most of them don't really notice that there's a house off the side of the highway, but a few people might notice that the, the barn, which is part of the same farm estate, is on the other side of the highway. I think this writing is stunning! So, please listen to this. This one is a keeper, and I can't wait to read this. I might not be able to stop reading this. Because there is nothing to see, nobody looks. And there are habitual travelers on this road who have never noticed the yellow wooden house marooned there in the grass below the embankment. In the lush months, its ancient trees screen it mercifully from the summer cars that go by, zip, 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 fifty a minute. It is only in the autumn, when the traffic thins, that the house begins to appear. The oaks reveal one gable, next week another, a window heliographing the sun. The sentry box side porch, as the copper beach begins to lose its claret leaves. By December, the old house stands nakedly, the broad meadow carpeting the hill behind, furnished with great trees, dark with winter firs. Anachronistic stretch of rolling parkland in a township where people with an acre's garden call it an estate. The traveler who sees both the house and the high red barn across the road from it realizes with a stab of pity that they belong together. On the other side of the highway, the same rolling pasture, the soft track with grass between the ruts, the splendid trees. In the moment before he is under the bridge and gone, he thinks, bad luck on them, and wisps of phrase like rape of the countryside and the automobile as Moloch go with him up the road and fall behind. If he comes back next year and remembers to look again for the yellow house, he will think he was mistaken. What was it he saw? Was it somewhere else? But the red barn is there, across the road, and the green slopes of meadow, and the trees. The house will be gone. Taken away, clapboard by clapboard, pane by pane, the banisters done up in bundles, to be set up two hundred miles away, outraged in an alien state. Why not? None of the family want to live in it anymore. Even Lori. Too much has happened. The headlong cars have the landscape to themselves. The road, in the end, has won. 
Okay, well here I am at my evening class. I have uh, private lessons at this Japanese drug company every Monday night. But just a few minutes before the first student arrives, I previewed, I Kindle previewed Jeanette Winterson's novel Light Housekeeping on the train right here. And I was surprised. Let me read you a couple of paragraphs that are very close to the beginning. I lived in a house cut steep into the bank. The chairs had to be nailed to the floor, and we were never allowed to eat spaghetti. We ate food that stuck to the plate, shepherd's pie, goulash, risotto, scrambled egg. We tried peas once, what a disaster, and sometimes we still find them, dusty and green in the corners of the room. Some people are raised on a hill, others in the valley. Most of us are brought up on the flat. I came at life at an angle, and that's how I've lived ever since. Okay, so don't you think that would have been so much better if she just left off the last paragraph? And that's what happened in the first five pages. She'd tell a little story, mostly kind of humorous, and then she'd tell the reader what it meant. No way. Hate that. Hate, hate, hate that. This particular brand of humor really didn't sit well with me, so this is not a book for me. I'm surprised. Okay. All right, so let's wrap this up, shall we? I had a blast doing this, and I discovered three books new to me that I very much want to read, and they I would rank them in the following order. The first one, I think you can gather, was the Monica Dickens novel from the year of my birth, 1966, The Room Upstairs. I just loved her writing. Second pick, which I also really loved, was the Catherine Mansfield short stories. The one that Ange had found was called New Zealand Stories, but I... I think I'd probably start with the garden party, but doing this tag got me to try a Catherine Mansfield story for the first time, and I loved it. And number three was the comic doctor novel, Doctor at Large, by Richard Gordon. And just to remind you, one of the premises of this particular novel is that one of his patients is inexplicably coughing up nuts and bolts. I'm looking forward to getting to those, and I bet you at least one or two, maybe all three, I'm going to buddy read with Ange. And don't you think so? So that was great. If you uh, like this tag, please do it. Consider yourself tagged. I'm going to specifically tag the following booktubers. Lindsay of Lindsay's Book Life. I didn't, I, I haven't learned the name of this booktuber, but her channel is called Hooked on Books. She says her name, but she says her name too fast in the videos that I've watched, and it's not in her show notes. Shatsa, Shatsa. So I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, Hooked on Books and Doris of All the Books and Beth of Read Remark. Thanks for watching.